The views, thoughts, and opinions expressed in the podcast belong solely to the hosts and not the hosts' past, present, or future employers. Hello, everybody. This is Brian for Breaking Down Security. Before we get started, a little addendum here. We did this interview the first of the month of March, so the first weekend in March. At the time, Washington State Schools and uh, the other areas that uh, our interviewers came from were not completely locked down yet. Uh, That changed as of the 13th of March. So uh, what you're hearing is what would happen in a, you know, uh, pre-coronavirus world. Uh, What we have now is complete shutdown. The threats and, you know, uh, landscape has changed quite a bit. Most organizations are trying to move to distance learning or work packages sent home by email. So I'm not saying there's less security, but the security has changed a little bit in terms of uh, the the threat landscape. So uh, just keep that in mind when we discuss various facets of this uh, of this interview and uh, uh, the one that happens next week as well. Okay, thanks. Hello, everybody. New week, new breaking down security. I'm Brian Brake. With me, as always, is Mr. Betcher. What's up? Not too much. Miss Berlin is uh, is out this week. Let me see. So let's uh, let's go ahead and get started this week. Uh, we are uh, here with uh, three people. We have three people. We, we it's very rare that we have this many folks on the on the show. Uh, one that uh, I I know because she's spoken at uh, the Infosec Campout last year on disaster preparedness uh, items. Uh, another gentleman we've uh, has been very active in our Slack uh, as as well, uh, and uh, I do not know the third person. So we're gonna um, invite everybody to introduce themselves. We'll start with April, uh, get a get a quick bio, and uh, and and talk about it, the uh, the topic we're gonna talk about this week. So I'm April Mardock. I'm the CISO uh, and operations manager for Seattle Public Schools. We're the largest district in the state of Washington. We have 104 schools. We have about 53,000 kids, 11,000 staff, and approaching 100,000 managed devices. So we're pretty big. And we have uh, challenges. We have threats pretty much full time uh, any day of the week, uh, some from inside and some from outside. Right on. Uh, Nathan, uh, go ahead. My name is Nathan McNulty. I'm the um, security architect for the Beaverton School District. We have a uh, little over 41,000 students, uh, 6,000 staff, 56,000 Chromebooks, about 10,000 Macs, 20,000 iOS devices, and another 4,000 PCs with one security person. Wow. Okay. Uh, Jared, how about you? Yeah. So I'm across the way from Nathan here in Oregon. Uh, so Bend, Oregon, uh, and I'm an engineer. Um, and that's day job. The, the I do part-time work doing pen testing and red teaming. Um, and I'm in Marcus and Jen's tribe of hackers red team. And we've got about, uh, close to 19,000 kids, uh, 4,000 staff, um, tons of devices and yeah, no full time, no security staff. So, mm. okay. So if you've, there, there's a theme going on here with the, the three people who've introduced themselves. Um, I, I think a little background on this, uh, I, there's been a lot of talk in the news about schools getting ransomware. And, um, you know, I, I had been talking to people who, and, and there was one story that I had seen, uh, one of the local schools here had been, um, ransomware in the, in the little after Christmas. And they had, they said, Oh yeah, we got back up within a few days. And I was like, huh, I wonder how that process works for a school that's, you know, been a subject of ransomware and, you know, some of the challenges that they have to see, you know, before, uh, during the incident and after, of course. Uh, and, you know, we haven't done a good incident response discussion or ransomware discussion. We're kind of, you know, at, you know, we're, we're paralleling all of that this week. So, um, and all of you, okay, so a little background for myself. I went to a school where I had 60 people in my graduating class. Um, it would, the way this was set up was small, medium, and large. I think it's probably medium, somewhat husky, and like super large uh, for, for in, my, in my experience uh, coming from a rural area. 
Um, I cannot imagine how a smaller school district is actually doing anything. I know Jared said he's got about 19,000 kids. Um, I, I'm fairly certain that a lot of the schools that I went to rurally probably have less than 10,000 kids and they don't have dedicated IT personnel at all. So let alone security. So, um, I would, I, I may actually reach out to some of those folks later on and find out exactly how they're planning on doing anything. Um, April, so you're, you have a security team, uh, well, I have 1.6 FTE. Sure. We have a very lightweight, uh, dedicated security team. I'm um, supposed to be managing all of operations as well as uh, cybersecurity. So I have 18 direct reports that are doing things like network and telecom and wide area network stuff, uh, data center even. Um, I have one full-time security engineer and I share half of a library analyst uh, that doubles as sort of filter and uh, security support in that context. So although I am large, um, we really, if you look at comparatively, the security staff I have versus any other normal organization of our size, it's pretty sad. Yeah. Um, how, why, why is it, why is it like that? Um, and considering the, the climate of, um, you know, schools, I guess are now considered somewhat of a soft target. Is there, has there been a change in the last six to eight months? And I'll ask all of you, uh, you know, with all the ransomware that's been on the news, uh, discussing soft targets like hospitals and schools, has there been a, a change in administrative thought about, uh, you know, the need to increase this, you know, the number of people who are helping with security? I do think some districts are actually adding security people that didn't before. Pretty sure Salem Kaiser was looking at that. And I think uh, there are several others in our area that are considering it. Mm -hmm. Um, Bellevue up here near Seattle spun one up. So I think there is an awareness and an interest in trying to provide those resources, but it's expensive. Um, One of the things that we're starting to do uh, is to work together uh, kind of at a grassroots level and, and do Intel sharing and supporting each other because we're trying to make do with minimal staff. Mm. Okay. Uh, Jared, what is, uh, what does Bend, Oregon look like for you after, you know, ha- are you using the, the media reports and articles as, you know, uh, Hey, you know, we need more help or, Hey, we need to invest in X technology. Are you doing any kind of work like that? Um, I think so. You know, first off, we've got that small grassroots like nonprofit thing that, uh, you know, Nathan, myself, and April are involved in the OPSEC EDU group. And that's kind of like just a grassroots um, ISAC thing that we built. Um, and so that's super beneficial, one, for that that knowledge sharing, as well as kind of building security people and building a small community catering to the specific issues in education, um, lack of resources and, and finance, finances being the general general bit there. But um, out of that, it's kind of been nice because when people share in that group, I can kind of compile that, you know, top five greatest hits for that week, right? And send mm-hmm. them off to stakeholders as you would think about it. And so that started to just slowly increase the the dial there on the stove and turn up the heat to where it's like, okay, this is this is not just once a month or, you know, once a week. Now it's several times a day we're getting reports of this happening. And so that's well, how it's going to come on our radar. We're also seeing that that's raising the awareness of the managers and the executive teams and the senior management of the school districts, uh, seeing that, wow, there really is direct threats that can be clearly documented and there are solutions and maybe we should be applying resources to it. I think we're seeing that visibility raised. Mm. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> so, uh, Nathan, you, you work over in Beaverton. Um, I'd ask you the same question. Have you seen uh, the same thing that Jared and April are seeing or is it uh, different for you? Yeah, so... Our journey started a little earlier uh, due to a um, BEC that we prevented from happening. Uh, so we started almost five years ago um, when we had a compromised account that was trying to basically uh, wire transfer fraud, right? Oh um, so that kind of started us on our journey, I think, before a lot of school districts were starting to get hit with this kind of stuff. So I think the awareness has gone up significantly. The problem is they're not entirely sure what to do about it at this point. Um, kind of when you're jumping into security, you don't know what you don't know. So they're thinking user awareness training, Um, like where do we even start with this? What kind of staffing do we need? Um, And what does all that look like? And I think that's where we're really struggling right now. Right. So you said it was a business email compromised or BEC. Um, 
you said it was wire fraud. What I mean, schools don't have that much money anyway. How are they, you know, it's not like, hey, I'm the principal, please wire $10,000 to this country, you know, this bank in China. Did so, I can't imagine that actually yeah. made it and worked. We, um, we had a $680 million bond. Oh. Um, yeah. Uh, we were oh. building multiple high schools, middle schools, elementary schools. Um, and of course, everybody's proud uh, that they landed the projects, right, for their bids. So we had a roofing vendor who actually posted on their website that, hey, we won this contract, right? So they got compromised and actually started that back and forth and um, kind of w- tried to work their way in. Uh, I accidentally stumbled upon it. Um, and then uh, the ne- very next day, actually, I had disabled the rules and was starting the work on uh, investigation. Um, and Southern Oregon University got hit for, uh, I believe it was like $2.1 million. Uh, what was actors. your job function at the time that you uh, discovered it? Yeah. So I was the um, Office 365 admin. So I managed all of our email, SharePoint, all that fun stuff. Um, so I was actually investigating something completely unrelated, had to do with um, uh, mail rules or inbox rules, kind of thinking something with event forwarding was going on. And when I hopped in there, I saw some rules that were like, whoa, wait a minute. Um, so that kind of started our security journey right there. Oh, okay. So the bad guys had gotten into your office 365 and set up mail rules to forward things to other people. Yeah. So they uh, compromised the roofing vendor and then replied in the existing chain. I need you to sign this document. When they went to log in, it was a different DocuSign page. Um, So she gave up creds and it was the same creds, obviously that she was using for the district. Mm. So um, they were able to hop into her mailbox and then basically back and forth trying to create a paper trail with a wire transfer. But the joke was kind of on them because we don't do wire transfers or we're just old school. So, yay. Yeah. <laughs> wow. Okay. Um, so, hmm. so to your point, it's millions of dollars in construction invoices that they're trying to scam. Right. Right. Yeah. I was, I was like, wow, that's, 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 that's hurtful, man. And that that's taxpayer dollars. Cause you know, they got that put on a ballot initiative. People voted yes or sometimes no. Uh, and they, uh, you know, that's, that's taxpayer money that's, that's lost. Um, so, uh, let me see. I've got some. Well, I think a good, a a good, interesting thing to what Mr. Betcher asked, Nathan's role at the time was not security, but now it is right. And I, I think there's a critical thing that all three of us, April, myself and Nathan can get behind. And that's when you have somebody like Nathan, who's clearly talented, uh, beyond their current role and their boss takes note of this right and sees this and sees nathan's passion and grows nathan into a position as a security architect um that's kind of a big piece to what the, i think our mission is is trying to figure out how to stair step the people that are passion passion driven into security roles right yeah um so i was i was trying to form this question in my mind uh, earlier so um I've worked at auditing hospitals, and uh, one of the things that administrators will tell me is, well, we can't be, you know, we can't implement those controls or we can't do that thing because we're trying to save lives. What is the excuses they give you when you tell them, well, we need to implement this? And they go, well, we're trying to educate kids. Is that what they try to tell you? Or is it like, uh, you know, we don't really understand what you're trying to tell us. It's some kind of mystical voodoo. What what kind of excuses do you get or... Um, it, I promise they're not going to, they're not going to hear you. Uh, so nobody listens to the podcast anyway, but, uh, what, what kind of excuses do you get from school administrators or people that, you know, are holding the purse strings? Uh, I'll go on that. Um, they, uh, it's the classroom instruction is really important. So we don't want to make impacts to uh, classroom instruction. Um, but another thing to keep in mind is we are a business. We do have a business office. We have HR, we have all those different functions and they operate very similar to any other business. So when we're impacting those, we're impacting their ability to do their work. Hmm. I think it's a, you uh, asked a great question earlier that had to do with um, why we don't make investments into security positions and uh, security controls in general. And that funds, uh, those funds are getting pulled away from a classroom. So as uh, administration, we're focused on ensuring good education for our students, and we're deciding to take uh, teachers out of a classroom in order to do some of these things uh, in some cases. And so they're pr- making their priorities that rather than, um, you know, a security thing that they're not entirely sure what that's actually going to get them. Mm. Okay. 
And I will also argue it isn't really an excuse, but the teachers that we hire are amazing, empathic, supportive, helpful people. That's what you want in a classroom. They're also amazingly helpful and supportive to the bad actors that try to fool them. Right. Right. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> during the uh, during the ramp up for this and when when April reached out to me and uh, said, hey, we should come on the show. And I was like, yes, absolutely. Because Mr. Betcher's got a few kids. I've got a, I've got a kid. They're all in school still. Uh, you know, the new hotness in the last few years is everybody gets a laptop, you know, because they can do things on it and, you know, watch videos and uh, educate, you know, educate themselves and distance learning and what have you and write papers and stuff because, you know, it, it levels the playing field. Some people, you know, may not have the ability to get computers because of financial situations or, or certain circumstances. So it's great to give the kids and enable the technology and stuff like that. But then you get, you hear stories. I was actually looking fairly diligently, but I could not find the story about kids who are bypassing those security controls. Um, April had had something uh, just about, you know, being able to bypass that. And there's YouTube videos. Uh, With a hostile environment, only, you know, bad guys trying to get wire transfers and you've got, you know, Billy and, and, and Jimmy and, and Jane who are trying to, you know, bypass your security controls. What, um, what do you, what do you, what are you doing to ensure that they, uh, are trying, uh, what are you doing to try to make sure that they're secure? I can take that from the start is you've got to practice safe computing with your students and your staff, right? Mm-hmm. So, There's how they hurt themselves and hurt you as an organization um, as a result if you allow them things like local admin rights, if you allow them things like the ability for their machine to harm others nearby um, because you've set all the machines to the same admin password. So if one machine's compromised, others become can't compromise. If you aren't micro-segmenting your network so that an attack that might be successful on a teacher's machine can't spread to student machines, there's a lot of layers to that game. It is more than just um, controlling and managing what the students are doing to try to get around the system. It's trying to make sure we keep them from getting exposed to hostile content, whether that's hostile content to them as individuals, um, like um, preventing them from getting to how to create suicide videos versus um, hostile content that might be, you know, malware that could get through. Okay. Uh, Jared, uh, what, what are... You know, what, what are some of the things you're doing at your organization uh, to, to help? Uh, do, do, do they get security training? Do kids get security training at, at your school or how does that work? It's like, you know, you got an adult telling them don't push that button. Well, they're going to push that button. So um, what, what, what are so you we, doing to try to dissuade them from doing so? We've got a one-to-one program and they do get trained on how to use their device. Um, so for us, luckily, We've committed to the iPads, um, which we did this way before, you know, the security things um, were really starting to, to come to fruition. Um, and so that has been nice with the MDM, our, our management system, to be able to lock that stuff down for students as well as, um, you know, we almost operate like an ISP when we backhaul traffic and stuff at this point to try to keep kids uh, within that filter. Um, and so... I think to what April spoke about, um, doing those basics, it sounds so easy, but I think it's, it's really difficult. Um, and kind of like segueing or or tying that together. I I think a teacher's goal is, is remarkable. And if you ever want to see a group set, um, be able to spin up shadow it faster in life, you will, you will encounter no greater group set. They are forced to be reckoned with and rightly so they're trying to educate kids. They're passionate about that. Mm -hmm. And that kind of bumps up against, you know, really viscerally security, right? Because if you turn off a feature, say in your G suite and that feature, that teacher or their five teachers at a school were dependent on that for their curriculum that they had developed at the beginning of the school year. And now you're turning it off in February. Well, you, you really upset some folks and they're going to do everything they can not to be mean to you, but to still accomplish their task. And they, I think that we're still grappling with is security, you know, is it really a, a, an honest conversation to have, or is this just more bureaucracy that you're slathering on top of me to slow me down as a teacher is kind of what my perspective is there. Right. I mean, 
it seems like at, at regular businesses, we see users that uh, would similarly rebel if things like local admin were uh, not allowed on their, their boxes because, you know, for whatever reason they are, uh, you know, they want to be able to install software or what have you. Um, have have all of you, and depending on your technology stacks, have you disabled local admin or administrative privileges on those boxes? And, um, you know, how easy is that to do and to maintain? Nathan? Yeah. So we are in the process of removing the remaining admin rights. Uh, what we did, uh, we've never had full admin rights for everyone, but what we did do at one point when we were um, cutting IT positions was that we allowed uh, staff to go through a training it uh, added them to a policy that allowed them to make themselves an admin uh, through a self-service portal. And then they were able to be admins on their box um, at that point. And so it's a, it's a fairly limited group, but for that group, we're um, pulling the remainder of that uh, right now. Um, so it's a, it's a difficult conversation. Um, I think the, your point to technology blew up on us way faster than we could keep up with, with the one-to-one. And um, they very much underinvested on the IT side because um, they wanted to spend it all on the devices. Um, so bringing that all back under control has been, uh, really, really difficult without breaking things. Okay. Uh, Jared, uh, you said you were using iPads. Uh, I, at least here in the Snoqualmie school district where my daughter goes, she has a, um, it's not a Chromebook, but it's, a, a like a, it, well, it is a Chromebook. It runs Chrome. Uh, but it's not like, you know, the Google Chrome pixels or anything like that. So um, I always considered those to be fairly secure and stable platforms, but I guess that there's ways to get around that stuff uh, as well. Uh, how, how does it work with something as expensive as, a, as an iPad? Yeah, so an iPad, you, you use your MDM. It's a, there's, there's several players in the game in, in the space. I won't name ours just for, for that sake, but um, you would use that MDM uh, and to, to manage all those devices, set those profiles, lock them down, um, figure out how to, uh, with those profiles, you know, specify your device that you're sending traffic to, um, push certificates to the device, right? So that they can auto, um, auto authenticate to your wireless. That's just student wireless, right? That would be an ideal. Um, so those are examples on the student side, uh, on the business side, or, and even the, the teacher side, right? Ch- trying to, do your best uh, again to um, remove admin credentials. So I come from a you know BSD and Solaris and then Linux background, right? So right. escalating privileges with sudo and stuff like that always made sense to me. Um, and so in the Windows world, uh, really dialing it in and going with laps and, and making sure that uh, on your servers and, and different things, um, you know those credentials have to be escal- escalated, and then you're you're removing that privilege um, when you're done with that work. And that's been a challenge too, because we've had to write some integrations and some tooling, right? Because we've got text in the field all over uh, thirty uh, over thirty four sites, right? For us, and um, you know when they need to escalate privileges, ha- ha- do you, are they in the same lapse group, or do we just give them? Uh, do we run an interface to like give them a web page that has two factor auth that they get the, the password for that machine? You know how do you do that stuff? And, and there's a mixture of homegrown ingenuity uh, combined with you know enterprise tooling. Right on, uh, uh, April. I wanted to ask because we had talked about this before we started. Uh, you've got things set up for for networking. Uh, you, I'm assuming you're collecting logs of your, of your devices that the, the end users have. How do you, how do you, I mean, Miss Berlin, she works for an MSSP. So, you know, they deal with endpoint, you know, logging all the time. How do you, how do you log or keep track of, uh, you know, potential infection vectors or potential infections on, you know, 40, 50,000 endpoints or, you know, uh, enterprise uh, environment like this? Well, I'm absolutely delighted with uh, my management for being willing to upgrade our Microsoft license to the full E5 slash A5. Um, It's given us ATP, the full Microsoft ATP suite, which means I have logging of every, I I scare some of the students uh, that I work with on this because we have logging of everything, every process, every command line, every network connection, every Anything that the machine does is being tracked in ATP right now. We have the logging turned up all the way, and we collect all of that centrally. So I can actually, when I see a compromised machine, which I saw a week less than a week ago, 
Hmm. Um, I can actually track it back, see which executable was brought on board from where, what it dropped, where it went, what it tried to do, um, all kind of like turning back the pages in a book so I can see what happened a day ago or a week ago. Nice. So we have alarms that come up through that system. I can see if uh, some Word document tried to drop a executable. I can see when a port scan starts. I can see all kinds of specialized alerts. And it does a pretty good job of only sending us uh, true alerts and not too many false positives. Mm. And, and the hard part is I've actually had to hire out a company because I need somebody watching my network and those alerts 24 by 7. The bad guys time their attacks to win, to uh, weekends and holidays when my staff are gone. And so I have to be able to respond and isolate a machine when I'm not in the office. Hmm. Okay. Uh, I could completely understand that if they know that, you know, you don't have a, you know, a team in a different time zone or something, you know, after midnight, you're, you're, you're fair game basically, uh, uh, because you're not monitoring it 24 seven. So that makes sense. Um, <clears throat> Uh, I was going to ask why schools are soft targets, but I think that's pretty much a given. Uh, you mentioned, uh, Nathan mentioned bond uh, information. Uh, there's a lot of information from people who don't necessarily have credit ratings yet, or, uh, you know, there's a lot of uh, educational information there that, uh, that you know, bad guys would like to automatically start slurping up that data and start using them for, uh, attacks or to, you know, ruin their credit that they don't have yet. Um, have you, have, is, is that, the, is that the motivation of the attackers is, is basically credential, uh, not credential grabbing, but you know, identity theft kind of stuff, or is it a different uh, threat? Uh, the stuff that we've seen attacks around tend to be more trying to redirect paychecks, uh, oh. uh, the fraud, and then also an attempt at ransomware. Uh -oh. You've seen several districts in this area already, uh, having fought that battle. Huh. And unfortunately, because we've seen some cities and other orgs pay the ransom, right. um, it's it's making that worse. Hmm. Okay. Yeah, many districts don't actually have social security numbers for students. I mean, they do for staff, right, for payroll, but uh, the students actually, they just get a state student ID um, unless they have like uh, special ed or something along those lines where it's actually health services and they're required to have the social on, on file. Right. Well, was it always that way or is that just something that's happened within the last... 10 years or so. Um, I'm not sure if that varies by district. April might more know more about that. Uh, I would say 10 years ago, we did have social security numbers. We don't anymore. Um, we haven't for five or six. And in fact, there was, if you do a lookup on it, there was a social security um, issue with local school districts in Washington, mostly because we were required to provide them to OSPI and the feds. Mm -hmm. And that data got um, compromised. Well, at least, potentially compromised because the the backups of that data were stolen i see okay uh, i've seen some attacks that you mentioned on paychecks as well if you don't have two-factor on the um on the um, company system that deal with uh healthcare companies um that is a target but let's talk about like okay why are schools soft targets uh, do you see attacks on the kids themselves or the kids computers and what what are the actors after when it comes to the kids machines mostly the kids just bring it in because they you know downloaded a key gen or whatever um you know it's a lot harder on the chromebooks for them to do stuff uh, the policies are pretty locked down and they really don't get to do much of anything on those uh, but if they bring like a personal device in we'll see that trying to spread itself out on the network right it's scanning um, but hopefully we have like API isolation, right. For our guest networks, so students devices can't touch anything, but, um, you see a lot of that kind of stuff. Uh, they'll bring in USB drives for sure, plug them into lab machines and those are infected. We'll see it catch some of that stuff. Um, but, uh, we have to expect all of the systems, uh, each of that step to fail, right? So we have the uh, E5 licensing as well with the EDR. And um, I expect the antivirus to fail. I expect the network segmentation to fail. I, I expect, you know, myself to fail. Um, we do log everything back into Greylog. Um, I, I like the quote that uh, Ira Winkler said. He's like, if you can, if a user can click on an attachment or run an application and ruin your network, your network sucks. Yeah. Like, I just, you have to expect everything to fail and, and uh, create accommodations for that. So, so you, Nathan, you said you, you did some network isolation. Do you, you've obviously 
do you have physical separation? Like, you know, they can only act, you know, certain switches are only used for certain traffic or are you even like using VLANs or anything like that? Or are you going like the full isolation uh, from the network? Yeah, we have several hundred VLANs. Um, as far as when they're on the access points, they're isolated uh, via an Aruba clear, pla- clear pass for us. But um, yeah, that's when they're joining into guests. They can't talk to anything except the internet, right? Um, but I think a really important thing to um, note as we're having all of these discussions is we're large districts and we have those resources and we have those services. If you go to a smaller district, though, they don't they don't have anybody who even understands how to set up a lot of these technologies. So it's it's an unfair uh, I don't know. comparison yeah yeah so uh jared i have a question about your technology stack each one of you sound like you've picked a different platform uh april has windows nathan has a lot of chromebooks uh, you have ipads what was the uh, and then I'll, I'll go to each one of you but was there a specific reason why you picked uh ipads i know that uh, I, I read some news stories about Google throwing their weight around and, you know, giving a lot of money to uh, educational institutions to, you know, supply them with this stuff. When I worked in San Diego, I would, you know, go to a local community college and it was full of, you know, Apple iMacs and stuff like that at the time with the ugly purple and blue, you know, things because they were cool. Um, you know, what, what, in terms of vendor management or vendor assessment for security purposes, why, why the, why the iPads? Um, yeah, I mean, it's kind of interesting. So, uh, at Beaverton, uh, there was a IT director, um, I think before Nathan was there, his name was Steve Carlson. And so he set up a lot of kind of the infrastructure by what he wanted. He was then the IT director for Ben Lapine for a number of years. Um, and so, Beaverton and Bend have many similar things. Um, iPads being one, I know that they, they've got way more Chromebooks than we do, um, but they also have iPads as well and Macs. And so that's a critical mm-hmm. thing for us is that when Steve Carlson came, uh, he you know, said, hey, we're going to do Macs. And that was just a decree. Um, and Bend, Oregon is different in that um, it's pretty, it's, it's affluent. Again, it's another differentiator from a, a school uh, small, you know, big school, small school, affluent district, a district that's struggling, right, to get parent involvement and, and, and community dollars. Um, and so luckily for Ben Lapine, we just always had a ton of community support and we still do. When we go out for a bond, uh, it passes. And um, so some of that stuff is just luck. Uh, and I would say Max, being heavily Mac up to this point has been a, a great thing for not suffering some of those same Windows-based attacks. But I don't expect that to last. I'm getting a lot more nervous about that as the months go by. Um, and I think that that's kind of a, a silent thing that's waiting to suddenly be exploited on different organizations at some point here soon. Mm, okay. Uh, April? Well... So the Windows machines that we have, we do everything that we can to lock them down programmatically. And and we decided that we would deploy something that we could manage to the nth degree. Um, The iPads actually turned out to be problematic in a few places. Um, Getting control of the YouTube content turned out to be problematic. And they don't have users that sign in. So tracking traffic to individual kiddos turned out to be quite the challenge for us. Hmm. Um, We don't prompt kids to log in when they go to the web. We just uh, infer it from the machine that they logged into. And so we were trying to minimize the the hassle in the classroom of trying to make kiddos log in um, to devices that weren't really designed to do that. So we do uh, K1 and 2 for iPads because of the, the touch and the simple nature of the interface. But pretty much 3 and above is all PCs for us. Um, and that gives us the ability to do quite a few things uh, that any platform uh, has its advantages and disadvantages. But we find that Windows gives us a huge breadth of functionality uh, and control, to be fair, um, not to mention, you know, a lot of the remote uh, functionality that we need for imaging and cleanup is also there, too. Mm. OK, Nathan. Yeah, so. Uh, we were looking at one-to-one, um, and I had brought the Chromebooks in uh, as some evaluations. The cost was very, very inexpensive. It was under $200 a unit for us. Um, so cost and then the limited functionality of it was the other selling point. Um, they were concerned about, you know, gaming devices for the students. If it was powerful enough that they'd just be playing games on it all the time. 
Right. Um, so we, you know, bought into 30,000 Chromebooks initially, and um, we've now doubled that um, almost. So um, the, the management interface is great. Unfortunately, what's happened over time is Google has really increased the cost of the devices. Um, they've gone up quite a bit as they've added like touchscreens and everything else. Mm-hmm. But um, they've also just are now increasing the cost of the uh, licensing for their cloud console. Um, and so that's hitting a lot of districts pretty hard right now, too. Right. Okay. Um, <clears throat> so thank you, Jared, for some of your questions here. It's, uh, you said, uh, you know, patching, it must be, um, somewhat nightmarish. Uh, how do how do you, how does, uh, each of your organizations handle, uh, you know, when the newest patches come out, when the new iOS version comes out, or even worse, when you find, oh, there's a new jailbreak for iOS. And now that jailbreak can be used on any iPod or iPad or i, I device that, uh, your, your school system uses, to, you know, get around your security controls. What, what kind of, uh, did, I mean, do you treat that like an incident response when a jailbro- uh, j- new jailbreak comes out or, or, or how does that work? Uh, we'll start with April this time. Uh, so on my side, uh, we're fairly, we do have some Macs and some iPads and those are just regularly managed through our MDM. Um, because we're so large with 100,000 devices, we do things in stages. So we have a group of test schools uh, elementary, middle, and high. We do the, the patching there first and almost immediately. And then we wait uh, a week or so after that before we deploy it to the domain at large, in part because we don't want to um, brick the whole district at once, as you might imagine. Right. Um, we're pretty careful with our rollouts in that context. We do um, pretty much everything by automation. We're still SCCM for our Windows deployment management, and uh, we use an MDM uh, on our iPads and Macs. Uh, that allow us to do that sort of remote uh, installation management support. Okay. Uh, uh, Nathan? Yeah. So uh, we actually have three different MDMs, uh, depending on the platform. Uh, You can't really manage Chromebooks outside of G Suite. So anybody who has Chromebooks, I mean, they're they're being managed in G Suite. Um, So then we have our Windows devices, which are still Config Manager. um, And then we have some uh, workloads shifted into Intune um, and working on that idle autopilot, you know, setup and all that. Um, and then we use Jamf for managing the Macs, which we have about 10,000 Macs and then uh, another 20,000 or so iOS dev- devices, too, that are managed in there. So we're a, we're a very large Jamf infrastructure. Goodness. All right. Jared, how about you? Yeah, it's pretty similar. I would say that we definitely struggle with um, getting to probably that tipping point of um, trying to align everybody with, with the patching schedule. Right. Uh, so with something that's, you know, if windows drops a new server patch, for example, or, uh, you know, when the Tuesday update type of thing, right. Um, we have a GPO that just applies that to a lot of our baseline servers automatically because we can trust the software stacks on there. Um, but in education and, you know, we, we've also got these software stacks that are running um, multiple layers of emulation to ultimately run a piece of COBOL code, right? Um, that, that stuff exists in education, I'm sure it exists everywhere, but that's that's 40-year-old code that's running. Um, and if we just blatantly apply the patch, all of a sudden we can't operate, we can't do day-to-day business because it just destroys that stack. Mm. So it's definitely a challenge there for those types of situations. Um, for the end user devices, um, we generally do a nag, which um, another uh, engineer wrote and created, which I think is really awesome. Um, I, 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 when he rolled out to my machine, I, I really appreciate it because um, even I can get caught up in not uh, wanting to restart. Um, but the nag it goes out to our teachers too to say, hey, this is the seventh nag and this is the sixth, right? And, and the nag just takes place after I think 30 days or something like that if it's not a uh, CV of, you know, a, a security patch of, of something. So um, again, some homegrown, some home baked stuff. Um, and then the MDM stuff that Nathan's talking about, we use that stack as well. And we've got actually about the same amount of devices. But the challenge then again, becomes we're at that tipping point where we don't have as many engineers who can do all that stuff so we're trying to codify codify your your uh your you know DevSecOps if you want to call it that type of stuff um is the only way you can scale especially in k-12 uh because at the end of the day if you don't have some scripts to reproduce it you're never going to do it again so we're, we're trying to apply those types of things to our entire infrastructure Cool. Yeah, and I kind of left out the, uh, we apply everything within 14 days, uh, generally, um, but we do it all in rings, as April mentioned. One of the things that up was um, state testing is rather interesting. So 
uh, when state testing is going, uh, we can potentially break the testing um, by applying certain patches. So, um, and, and the tester will actually say, we don't support uh, Chrome OS this version. So we actually have to hold the devices back until testing is completed, which leaves us vulnerable. So, uh, you know, there it's <laughs> it's really hard. So when you have state testing like that, do you, do they come to you and go, okay, you know, state testing is coming up. We're only going to use, you know, what Chrome Chrome nine or something like that. And we're like, well, we've already upgraded to ten. Do you have to force downgrades? Is no. that even possible? Nope, you can't. Okay, uh, so April, Jared, do do any of you ever come with you know vendors and they're like, oh, we're using you know this version because it's old and because that's the the standard across other systems and it's like, oh, we only use Windows seven and oh well, we're already on ten Flash. and it won't work. Right, we use Flash. Oh God, we use Flash. <laughs> do you still have Flash, y'all environment? Java. And there are, yeah, oh. Flash and Java both oh. and some I'm, older educational apps. I just killed Flash and Java the last one this year. So God yay. bless you, sir. We're working on that. You're ahead of us. <laughs> God bless you, but, sir. And and to be fair, I will say vendors are a liability for us in a bunch of different ways. Yeah. Um, yep. I, that was that was another way I was going to be heading here with regards to vendors. How do you do assessments of vendors or is it you know, pretty much the vendor takes the, the superintendent of the schools to lunch and automatically you've got this brand new Flash app. <laughs> I wouldn't say it's quite that bad. <laughs> That's awesome. But, well, it we happens have... in it happens in our world, in the InfoSec world, where it's like, <laughs> oh, I don't, this is crap. CISO gets taken to lunch and then you've got, you know, the Gartner approved whatever app. So yeah, I just yeah. wondered how it works for y'all. Uh, shiny things do sometimes come that that way through executives, but most of the time we actually have a formal uh, evaluation process now because we have to look at the privacy uh, implications of what we bring on board. So we're looking at the EULA, we're looking at the privacy agreement, we're looking at how they manage the student data, that the data belongs to us, that, that the, we can demand that the data be deleted. Um, and that they have processes and controls around it because our vendors are in some ways how some education data is getting owned now. Do you audit your vendors? Uh, like we do. Uh, sometimes we have a formal audit requirement uh, and sometimes it's informal, um, but we are definitely holding our uh, vendors to account uh, legally uh, through multiple, uh, every every new contract that comes up or any contract that comes up for renewal, we now make sure that all of the appropriate modules are added so that we have those control. And I think the key point there is putting it in the contract, right? Um, Access for Learning, A4L.org, um, has some great frameworks. Um, they manage a lot of the privacy stuff. And so we've uh, partnered with them as a lot of districts in the area do. Um, so that's a really cool resource uh, to kind of vet applications and they can kind of get approved for privacy policies um, across the board for all districts if they agree to some of that stuff. So I think, I think the, again, the way the we're, the we're all talking here, um, it, it it's sharply drops off, right? People are struggling down with, with the smaller districts to just trying to grapple with any of this stuff. So we are blessed that we actually have some of these luxuries to actually accomplish this stuff. That is true. There's, at least in Washington, we're trying to come up with a universal uh, contract that has all of those bells and whistles in it, that once we've signed that contract, little districts can tack on and use it uh, without having to go through the same level of work. It's been sort of pre-authorized wow. in a way. Now, you say you've been blessed, but really that's relative. You're in, the, in the grand scheme of things, you're not. You're still struggling right? For resources and, and funding. Yeah, absolutely. Sorry. I, I'm, I try to be an optimist, right? I try to, yeah. I try to say that I could, I could look at all the problems that we have and say that I'm, I'm not going to try to do anything about it. Or I can say, Hey, these are the good things I got going for us and I'll operate from that perspective. But you're absolutely right. We are vastly under-resourced like April was saying. Hmm. Yeah, one of the other interesting things in education, you get these teachers who like spin off their own uh, education app, right? Um, because it, it was something that they wanted to have available when they were teaching. Um, well, your CASB doesn't catch those. Uh, CASBs are designed for enterprise, right? So I'm sitting there watching all the applications people are using, and we have absolutely zero insight into some of these education applications that they're using because there's like 300 users of it, and nobody's ever classified it before. And that was it for part one of our discussion with April Mardock and Nathan and Jay Folk about uh, school security. We thank them for joining us uh, for part one. Part two, we'll, uh, we'll go further in depth about uh, 
the resources they have available to them or uh, what they don't have available to them. So um, <clears throat> we also talk a little bit about um, some IoT and, and tablet-based uh, issues that they're having as well for, for devices and, and, and that. So uh, thank you to all of our patrons for continuing to support us during the, uh, the times that we're having. As we always say, the podcast will always be free, but we appreciate them for, for going that extra mile to uh, support the show, support the education and th- that we try to give out every week, new content, what, what have you. We are also uh, very thankful to all of the people who support us on Twitter and in our Slack channels. Uh, if you're interested in joining the Slack channel, you can always DM us or send us an email, uh, bds.podcast at gmail.com. Our Twitter handle is at BreakSec on Twitter. I'm Brian Break on Twitter. You can follow me there. Miss Berlin, you can find her at InfoSister. And Mr. Betcher can be found at Betcher Pwned. Uh, if you cannot give to our tip jar on patreon we have a number of other ways that you can help out we have uh we're on various platforms that have feedback uh enabled so if you are are on pandora or spotify or you enjoy um, itunes or use the google play store or iHeartRadio or soundcloud or what have you please leave some feedback on those all they you know five you know five minutes of, of text on a on a, a network like that would uh, give us more exposure, give us a better search engine algorithm optimization thing, uh, or, uh, you know, just, just get more people to, to see our podcast and, and help out. So we appreciate anything you can do with that on any of those, uh, platforms. Uh, also have a store, our T public store. If you would like to go ahead and buy a t-shirt, uh, that's another way you can help support us. We get a little kickback from t-shirts or mugs or stickers since, People can't go to conferences. Miss Berlin and Mr. Betcher and I, we can't make it to conferences. Uh, sticker swap is always available on the T Pub store. You can download the break, you know, get a um, get a sticker from the T Pub store. That's breaksec.com forward slash store. Of course, our podcast website is breakingsecurity.com, B R A K E I N G security.com. And uh, that was it for the week. If you are feeling little under the weather or you feel like you um you know need somebody to talk to please hit up our slack we do have a mental health channel uh, miss berlin uh, has hackers health i know she's doing a lot of uh, online virtual stuff at this time which is uh, of course 28th of march you can always check to see what she's doing online uh, uh, that may not always be the case depending on when you're listening to this but right now with uh, everything going virtual she is definitely having regular meetups or discussions and there's there's a lot of virtual stuff going on conferences and what have you please uh, please take advantage of those if you uh, if you can so that was it have a great week um, be kind to one another on social media be kind to one another in person uh, even if it is uh, 1.8 meters or six feet away take care of yourself of course because uh, you are the only you you have and everyone somebody is depending on you i would imagine so please take care of yourselves and uh, we'll talk to you again soon